but it's sort of an impossibly broad topic. I mean, if somebody were to come up over here and talk about, say, morality and Christianity, they'd probably spend an hour just going through the varieties of different ideas that Christians have about morality without really even getting any of the details. It's much the same with Islam. It's pretty much an impossible talk. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on a particular concern. And uh, this actually will work pretty well dovetailing with the previous talk. Uh, so I'll be mentioning some Islam today, uh, some morality in the context of politics, because uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, politics and morality are broadly speaking uh, very strongly overlapping domains of our lives. And really my main theme is probably going to be about the role of education, and in particular science education, in Enlightenment style politics. Uh, most people I imagine in the audience would describe themselves in some form or the other as rather secular, uh, most likely rather secular liberal people. And uh, I want to sort of talk about uh, how science education plays in uh, this Enlightenment style politics. So let me start with uh, something fairly close to home, at least for me, uh, for those uh, we're in Kansas right now, but it's still right the next state over. In Missouri, uh, we pretty much have a routine. Almost every year this happens uh, that the Missouri legislature will start considering certain bills which typically allow for teaching creationism or intelligent design in public schools. And uh, 2013 hasn't gone too far so far, but we still have a couple of notorious ones. So at the beginning of the year, we tend to gear out, and those of us in science and science education start sending out their emails saying, oh, another horrible bill has appeared in the Missouri House. And let me quote from a couple of them. Now, by the way, these almost always die in committee, never make the floor. And probably this is going to be the fate of this one's too. But just the fact that these continually are out there really does end up putting a lot of pressure on science education. And right now in House Bill 179, one quotation from that would be, no one shall, pro uh, shall prohibit any teacher from helping students understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner the scientific strengths and scientific weaknesses of biological or chemical evolution. This is kind of standard boilerplate these days because they can't kind of legally get creationism in the classroom directly. Uh, but the language today tends to be in the form of criticizing evolution. We're talking about the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. Uh, and we have an even more interesting bill in Missouri right now, and even crazier. Uh, that's 291. And one quotation from the rather long text of the bill is, if scientific theory concerning biological origin is taught in a course of study, biological evolution and biological intelligent design shall be taught. So this is kind of an equal time for intelligent design kind of law. And unfortunately, as with most everything in the United States, Missouri is a very typical state. Just about any statistics you look at in Missouri, uh, we tend to fall right about in the middle range of things. So if these types of bills are being discussed in Missouri, you can be sure that it's being, they're being discussed all over the country in different state houses. Uh, and a good place to watch these, of course, is, uh, to keep, if you want to keep track of these, is the website of the National Center for Science Education. There's always a lot that's going on. But that's something that we're probably reasonably familiar with. Uh, the United States tends to have a very strong uh, Christian, uh, conservative Christian subculture. But this is also a global phenomenon. Uh, so uh, let me focus a little bit more on the American situation first, because that's what we're more familiar with. Uh, first of all, creationism is very popular in the United States, but the support for it is also kind of limited in a way. Uh, if you look at polling, that's been done on this for many decades right now. Uh, the most consistent one has, is perhaps the Gallup poll. And since 1980, more or less the same questions have been asked, so they can really compare this from year to year. Uh, around about 45% of the American public will tend to support a point of view that might be described as young earth creationism. In other words, the sort of six days, 6,000 years ago, Noah's flood happened type of creationism. About 45% of the public typically, again, in this particular Gallup poll, will support a point of view that might be described as guided evolution, in the sense that common descent happened, but it was a divinely guided process and not the sort of Darwinian uh, random variation selection process as biologists understand it. And it's only about 10% of the population that really goes for a more naturalistic idea of evolution as uh, biologists think about it.
Uh, now, of course, it depends on uh, what kind of poll you're looking at, how the question is phrased. Uh, the answers might differ. For example, that uh, graph I put up over there is with a different poll with different questions, uh, but the results are fairly consistent. You can see that the biggest slice on that pie chart is people who support, uh, support creationism with 48%. Uh, at that time, this is from 2001. As I said, the numbers really don't change much over the years. However, one interesting thing in the United States, and one thing that's very useful for me, uh, people like me who are in science, is that creationism and intelligent design are very much unacceptable in the intellectual high culture of the United States. So since the educational environment uh, tends to be uh, much more dominated by the intellectual high culture, uh, there's very little penetration of ideas such as creationism and intelligent design into public education. Uh, certainly almost, no, uh, it's almost non-existent in higher education and you get, uh, you get little of it in uh, public schools uh, in the secondary level. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of creationism in education, particularly in more informal settings and in private parallel uh, education uh, environments in the United States, such as, say, various Christian academies, uh, there's a lot of creationism going on. It's just that it doesn't appear much in the public arena. Now, let's compare that to the situation that happens in the Islamic world. Uh, and I have a Turkish background. I grew up in Turkey, so I spent a lot of time in both countries. And one of the interesting things that happens when you compare both countries is that there's a fairly strong presence of creationism, including in education in both countries. Uh, but in Turkey, it's actually even stronger. Uh, so if you ever get interested in, say, the Islamic version of creationism, uh, which, in, uh, which is kind of fascinating both in its similarities and its differences uh, when you compare it to the Christian version. Uh, for example, the Islamic version doesn't make much out of Noah's flood or anything like that. They tend to be more old earth people. But anyway, if you get interested in this, just do a Google on uh, the name Harun Yahya. And he's probably the leading Islamic uh, purveyor of creationism right now. Uh, its origins are in Turkey, but it's become very internationally popular and almost everything is available in the um, English language because, well, English is the international language these days. And it's very much strict creationist. It denies common descent, just like people say, for example, from the Institute of Creation Research here in the United States would. And you'll also notice that there's a large amount of borrowing from Christian creationists that uh, exists in the Islamic uh, creationism. Now, what is perhaps most interesting, particularly from a political point of view, which is what I want to concentrate on today, is that the Islamic version of opposition to evolution is a very successful uh, type of creationism, unlike the United States, where we have something of a stalemate. In many Muslim countries, the creationists enjoy pretty much uh, uncontested victory, in that in many Muslim countries, Creationism is actually present in public education to some degree or other, sometimes together with evolution. Uh, indeed, one important difference between many Muslim countries and the United States is that uh, creationism, uh, mostly in uh, more sophisticated intelligent design type of variants, uh, actually enjoys considerable acceptance in the intellectual high culture of many of these countries. And uh, the, of course, the grassroots level, uh, the popular level opposition to evolu uh, religious opposition to evolution is perhaps even stronger than in the United States. Or rather, what you might say is that uh, the situation in many Muslim countries is perhaps comparable to, say, regions of the United States that are very strongly dominated by evangelical Christianity. Uh, this graph I put up over there is something I often use. Uh, this was a poll a few years ago, uh, mainly of European countries, but there's also Japan and the United States uh, in there, and also Turkey. Uh, and this is about the level of acceptance of evolution and creation in different countries. Uh, the blue bars are uh, the acceptance of evolution, and the red is favoring creationism. Uh, and interestingly, uh, as you might imagine, it's the Scandinavian countries which are extremely secular and where organized religion is much less of a presence in daily life these days. Iceland, Denmark, and Sweden are way at the top in uh, accepting evolution and creationism is, is almost negligible presence. But if you look at down towards the bottom of those bars, the last two countries are, well, uh, second from the last is the United States. Uh, where the acceptance of uh, creation evolution is about on the same level. And the very last country is Turkey, the only Muslim country in this particular survey uh, where actually creationists are the majority. And you have other studies of Muslim countries to uh, different Muslim countries that show pretty much the same sort of situation. Uh, 
Uh, if anything, Turkey is not quite that bad. It's very middling in terms of Islamic countries and in terms of, eject, uh, of rejecting evolution. So now, most of us involved in, say, uh, science education, and even most of us who, say, would describe themselves politically as kind of secular liberals, are probably going to react in news like this as saying, well, this is a deplorable situation. Uh, so among scientists and among people who describe themselves as politically liberal, there's a very strong opposition to creationism. And this really is almost independent of people's attitudes towards science. Uh, say, for example, uh, my colleagues from, say, the humanities departments at uh, the university where I teach, uh, some of them are quite indifferent to science, mostly in their everyday lives. But when I'm trying to sort of drum up support uh, among educators uh, when, say, some of these bills in Missouri show up, I very almost automatically get very strong support from them uh, against creationism uh, because, well, they don't like the religious right for obvious reasons. And if you dig deeper into the reasons that secular liberals tend to give for opposition to creationism, you usually get statements like, well, obviously, I mean, we should give students the best of our knowledge, shouldn't we? And, but the, interestingly enough, of course, then the question is what determines what is the best knowledge? And people who describe themselves as secular liberals tend to think that the, pro the best knowledge is determined by the proper set of experts. So there's very much of a sub-theme over here of trusting secular expertise. And push a little bit further, uh, you also have arguments such that people being educated in the best of what science has to offer is in the public interest. And this public interest can be explained as, say, what we want to do is to prepare our students for a modern citizenship at the national level. We, we don't so much care about little local cultures and variations, but we're interested in how things appear on a national, even international stage. So there is that element of things. And this actually, this type of argument is pretty common, uh, say, for example, with my experience in Turkey as well. Uh, people who try and oppose the presence of creationism in Turkey, unfortunately rather unsuccessfully, uh, tend to make very similar arguments uh, that uh, we need to teach the best of science, the best of science is determined by the proper experts, and if we keep teaching this creationism in our classrooms, Turkey is going to suffer, uh, so on and so forth. So very similar arguments to what you might get in the United States. However, these arguments, uh, well, tend not to wash very well with cultural conservatives, including religious conservatives. And uh, given that uh, both in Turkey and in the United States, uh, political conservatism is much the more dominant point of view, typically, uh, they, their arguments bear looking at. And uh, the first thing cultural conservatives generally tend to say in this type of thing is they tend to react badly to the notion of everybody being taught the same thing depend, uh, that, that is determined by what we consider the proper experts. Uh, conservatives tend to favor local, organic, and in particularly religious communities and markets as opposed to expertise, which is typically linked to state structures. So very often conservatives will equate expertise to, say, a bureaucracy and impositions by a kind of self-appointed elite strata of society. And their arguments, again, both in Turkey and in the United States, tend to be very populist in character in the sense that they argue that popular education should be shaped by democratic concerns, by populist concerns, and uh, this elite imposition of what we consider proper knowledge therefore goes against the spirit of democracy in this sense. So indeed the global politics of evolution education tends to, uh, tends to have these sort of similar themes. In the United States we still have a kind of a liberal dominance in the educational environment, though it's weakening. Uh, but I think it's interesting in particular to look at Islamic examples because as I mentioned before, uh, these kind of show you uh, an educational environment where creationism is actually successful and very much more present than in the United States. So in Turkey, uh, in politics in general, this kind of religiously conservative uh, populism is very much the triumphant point of view. Uh, there's almost no other alternative in play right now that has any chance of political success. Uh, even though Turkey has a reputation somehow of being a secular Muslim country, uh, it's rather a misplaced reputation. I, I, even a, a few decades ago, I would have had a hard time des uh, describing Turkey as a, 
really as a fully secular country. It's become much less so since then. Uh, and if you look at other countries, such as, say, Iran or Pakistan, uh, you get situations like you, you will, in fact, have evolution in secondary uh, science textbooks in the sense that common descent, the idea that we have a common ancestor, say, with an, uh, any other life form, could be mentioned. Uh, but this also is uh, put in a protective package uh, in that very often, explicitly what the textbooks will produce is a version of guided evolution, evolution under explicit divine guidance. And they're also, uh, will tend to emphasize what they think are limitations of uh, evolution. And in particular, one uh, particular concern in the Muslim world is that humans are supposed to be a special creation apart from the rest of life. Uh, because of, uh, well, the Adam and Eve story is one of the few stories that appear in some detail in the Quran. So given the situation, the political question that uh, people like me often don't like to confront, but have to, is, uh, well, why teach evolution in the first place? Because this has to be a political argument. And if we could rely on a common secular liberal outlook in the population at large, which is something that you might have, say, for example, in Scandinavian countries and much of northern and western Europe, that's going to work. But we can't rely on a common secular liberal outlook in the United States or the Islamic world or really any highly religious culture. So in this case, uh, the arguments that we have to make every time, say, for example, these bills in Missouri come up or in Kansas come up, uh, our arguments have to be different. And very often when the editorial writer starts arguing that no, creationism should not appear in the science standards and things like that, uh, what we have to do is find a lower common denominator uh, than uh, what secular liberals might have amongst themselves. So very often this means an appeal to common material interests. So the editorial writers will start saying things like, well, if we have creationism in a science class, that's going to harm science education. And ultimately, this is going to harm the economy. And if something's going to harm the economy, of course, it's a no-no. Uh, another way of uh, trying to approach this is to say, uh, is to try and encourage the confusion between science and technology. Because very often, religious conservative cultures uh, though they might be uncomfortable with a lot of, say, modern science, uh, they are very enthusiastic typically about technology. And this is something that's true not just among, say, uh, American creationists. They're really enthusiastic about technology, maybe even inappropriately so. Uh, it's also true in uh, many uh, Islamic environments as well. People tend to be uh, religiously conservative and also very pro-technology. So that might be an argument that has a chance of some success in saying that, no, we should not have too much creationism or similarly religiously based ideas in public science education. However, these arguments may not work as well as we hope. Uh, for example, one common argument is that we want to say that we need uh, science literacy in a wide segment of the population. This is one of the reasons we want science education at all levels, and we want good science education for the population uh, at large. And for secular liberals, often the rationale behind that is it's because of our conception of democracy. Uh, for democratic decision making and proper participation in a knowledge economy of these days, our argument tends to be that people have to be properly educated. You cannot make proper democratic decisions, properly participate in a democratic politics, if you're going to be someone who's totally ill-informed, if your decisions about matters is going to be determined almost entirely by what your preacher says. However, uh, there are problems in trying to make this as a political argument uh, and appealing to a broader base than people who are already converted to a secular liberal point of view. Now, science education, uh, one problem with it is very resource intensive. It's expensive stuff. Uh, not only because we need laboratories and everything, but also training a science teacher, uh, say a decent science teacher for high school level, is actually very expensive. And really, uh, the theme of what we're doing in science education in schools tends to be uh, largely, the, it's not like, say, somebody in high school is going to really appreciate all of the details of, say, why evolution is the correct explanation of what's going on, even less that somebody in high school, say, might be able to understand the details of quantum mechanics. 
What largely is going to happen at these levels of education is we encourage people to kind of try to identify who are the proper experts and trust the proper experts. So a lot of science education, especially at the secondary level, is a process of encouraging deference to what, who we consider are the proper experts. And so therefore, conservatives, with, when confronted with this type of argument, very naturally suspect that there's actually a kind of a liberal bias built in to the secular liberal conce uh, conception of democratic participation in the first place, particularly because we're trying to let experts take the lead in many of these issues over here. So maybe what we can do is narrow the argument uh, and appeal to the love of technology of religious conservatives. And again, appeal to, say, the state of the economy. Uh, because one argument we might make is this. If science education is not doing too well, uh, well, maybe that's going to mean that we're not going to have enough people in the country who are going to be uh, engineers and so forth. And particularly the acronym that gets thrown on around a lot these days is STEM professionals, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And the idea is that in a highly advanced uh, technological economy, people in the STEM fields are supposed to be driving the economy. And therefore, if you do not teach people uh, science properly, say at the high school level and so forth, that's going to restrict their opportunities to go into these STEM fields. And in fact, overall, as a nation, we might suffer in, uh, in these uh, STEM fields. And again, precisely the same sort of arguments, by the way, uh, are applied in, say, places like Turkey. Uh, when somebody tries to argue that it's a bad idea to have creationism in textbooks, uh, and in Turkey, of course, the argument would be, let's try and get rid of the creationism that's already there, uh, arguments like this, typically newspapers will come to the fore. Uh, but again, uh, there are problems with trying to push this as a political argument that's going to appeal more from the people who are already converted to this sort of point of view. We end up preaching to the choir. And one reason is uh, STEM professionals are a very small percentage of the population. And when you're talking about arguing for evolution education in schools, you're arguing for a very broad-based science education. And uh, it, it becomes harder to justify this when only a small percentage of the population is going to go on and specialize in the STEM fields in the first place. And an even deeper problem really is this. Uh, when, we're talking about it, when we're talking about educating people in basic biology and physics and so forth, we are talking about basic physics. The reason we're interested in this is we want people to have an idea about how the universe works. This is not at all the same thing as technology. And economically speaking, it's, prob it's probably much more important to have applied science in uh, various countries, including Islamic countries in the US. And when you look at the culture of applied science, is actually quite different from that of basic science. Now, my background, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I started out as an engineer. And I come from a family of engineers, uh, a family of basically applied scientists. So you can say that many of my friends actually are in technology fields. They're in applied science and engineering. However, I've ended up working in basic science myself, in physics. Uh, and so I know a bit about the culture of both. And also, this is something that sociologists have studied. And there is a distinct difference between the cultures of applied science and basic science. Basic scientists tend to be much uh, more religiously skeptical. Uh, say, for example, if you're hanging around physicists, uh, that they, they are religious non-believers is almost a default position. You take that for granted. Uh, we're surprised when a physicist is actually very religious. Not that it doesn't happen. Whoa. Not that it doesn't happen, but it's, it's fairly rare. I mean, I, I, I take, say, for example, people who come to the department and give talks out to dinner, and as often happens, conversation drifts into the interesting bits, the politics and religion. Almost always, they're going to be A, non-religious, and B, going to be politically fairly liberal. And really, that's the culture of basic science. But if you go to the engineering departments, if you go to applied science, it's actually quite different. Uh, they tend to be much more conservative. Uh, they tend to be much more religious. And this includes creationism. Uh, say, for example, uh, when you study, what you, polls have been done uh, with applied scientists to see what their level of uh, support for creationism is. Typically, f you find that the level of support for creationism is notoriously high among engineers. Uh, many creationists, both in Turkey uh, in, and in the Islamic world in general and in the United States, are actually engineers themselves. And also medical doctors, 
uh, they tend to have a much higher percentage of uh, creationists amongst them uh, than biologists, where it's completely negligible. So if you're making the argument that applied science has to be the driver of the economy, and this is the reason why we need better science education, uh, you run into the problem that uh, there are a lot of people out there who are very highly educated in the applied sciences who actually are creationists, and uh, applied science is really a different world than basic science in this regard. So maybe you want to get even more narrow in your arguments. Again, uh, editorial writers will try and say things like, well, if, you, if uh, creationism doesn't appear in schools, maybe biotechnology companies, because after all, biotechnology is supposed to be the big thing in the 21st century, uh, and biotechnology companies are going to be more reluctant to locate in states where you have creationist influence on uh, education there and so forth. And indeed, the prospects for medical and biotechnological firms uh, flourishing in their states might not be very good. However, again, uh, this argument, I think, is not a very good argument necessarily for broad-based uh, science education in concepts like evolution. Even if you try and make the argument that evolution is practically necessary if you're going to understand biology today and therefore do biotechnology, that argument is actually fairly underdeveloped uh, where we stand right now. So people talk about, say, for example, evolutionary medicine about how understanding Darwinian evolution might be very important in certain areas of medicine. Uh, people who make this argument have not been able to say, for example, convince medical schools. Uh, there are very few medical schools that would apply, uh, that would uh, really uh, offer their students any courses in evolutionary medicine. Uh, and as I said, uh, medical doctors tend to be uh, in many ways a much more creationist constituency when compared to, say, biologists. So well, you know, let's get down to say maybe it's technology, uh, technology corporations, maybe, and this argument I think has some merit. Uh, the idea is if you're having a religious influence on your science education, maybe this is sending a signal. It's not so much the content that's important over here, but you're sending a signal to technology corporations that this is a very religious environment, and so therefore it might be not very good for biotechnology. And the connection might work this way. Uh, biotechnology firms often work on uh, issues that have to do with, say, things like reproductive technologies and so forth. And among religious conservatives who are also creationists, they are also the constituency who tend to be very suspicious about biotechnology and very suspicious about applying a more secular ethical point of view uh, to new uh, medical technologies and so forth. Uh, so they tend to have this idea that we should not play God uh, with the new biotechnologies. So the idea might be that if, say, for example, a state legislature passes laws encouraging creationism in some form or the other, this also sends a signal to the biotechnology corporations that this is a very religious environment that even if they're, what they're working on has nothing to do with evolution, maybe it has to do with reproductive technologies and so forth, which is also going to... Uh, attract opposition from uh, religious constituencies. So there's some argument over there, uh, but I wouldn't push it too far. Uh, there, there's a certain, uh, to a certain extent, it's also dubious, uh, because just because uh, technology corporations, say, might be very highly represented in a certain locality, does not necessarily mean it's going to be the best environment for all aspects of basic science. Because again, as I mentioned, the culture of applied science and the culture of basic science tends to diverge from one another. Uh, for example, uh, take Silicon Valley in California, uh, which is sort of one of the high-tech centers in the country that anybody would think about. Uh, but it's also very notorious for being a new age hotbed. So you go to Silicon Valley, maybe you're going to get the latest in, say, people thinking about computer hardware and software. But you're also going to get the very latest in uh, various gurus. And you're going to get the very latest in people having all sorts of crazy alternative medicine stuff. So you're not going to get creationism there, but you're not necessarily always going to get across-the-board friendliness to science either. Or, for example, uh, uh, take, say, for example, India today. Uh, India is uh, actually doing very well in certain technological areas, including software, but the sort of up-and-coming Indian middle class who might be very enthusiastic about technology uh, and increasingly developing global market share in various technologies, uh, they're also very much into Indian astrology and various Hindu pseudosciences. So uh, the idea that creationism is an issue of signaling uh, 
to various companies, I think is a minor issue at best. So I think where this leaves us is kind of this. Uh, we tend to make arguments favoring science and say, hey, the best of science should be taught in schools. Uh, but in making these arguments, I think often we ignore uh, the costs of basic science. And when I say cost, I don't just mean monetary cost, though that's part of it. Uh, science is often costly to support, and it's not always true that you get direct economic benefits from supporting science. Okay, maybe indirectly further down the road, yes, but not directly. And it's not just a matter of evolutionary biology. There are many fields in science which are intellectually very, very interesting and uh, fascinating, uh, such as astronomy. Uh, but it's often difficult to make the argument that, say, uh, when I, uh, with my ast uh, astronomy colleagues, that anything that they're doing is going to uh, plug in directly to an industrial economy. It doesn't really work that way. As I mentioned before, science education is very, very costly. Uh, not just because of the equipment that we need, but also because uh, uh, having good science teachers is a very, very expensive proposition. And also there are cultural costs to science education. If you're in a country like in the United States, uh, where you have uh, culturally conservative, especially religiously conservative communities uh, in a strong position, uh, you do have to keep in mind that uh, basic science education can sometimes impose steep cultural costs on conservative religious communities. And anybody in politics, any politician, would be insane if they did not keep this in mind. So uh, the constituency of secular liberals is not the only con constituency that they need to satisfy. And in fact, evolution, uh, historically and globally, has been particularly disruptive in this regard. Uh, that's what our history with evolution education suggests. Whether it's a conservative Christian environment or a conservative Muslim environment, uh, putting evolution into a requirement of the curriculum, a particular a secondary level, it immediately generates opposition. In fact, this is one of the prime motivations for various pseudoscientific movements, uh, such as the Christian science that we see in the United States and lately very strongly in Muslim countries. So really, it's a global matter. Conservative religious rejection of Darwinian evolution uh, should give us a pretty good idea that this is socially disruptive stuff. And so therefore, if you're a politician looking at science education, how much you're going to fund science education, especially in these times of economic austerity, the social and political cost of interfering with religion might look a little bit too high to you if you're a politician these days. So in some ways, if you're trying to build a kind of a secular liberal argument for supporting science education in matters like evolution and to have this broadly available to the population, reaches kind of an impasse. Uh, because when you're talking about, say, liberal political theory, we tend to sort of try and do things like, say, we try and reach an overlapping consensus between different points of view so that different constituencies in, that make up the public might support the same sort of thing even though we support it for different reasons. But right now, it's looking like the liberal appeals to a kind of expertise, as in biologists know their stuff, they're the proper experts, they should determine what, what turns out in biology textbooks. These are not entirely persuasive these days outside of a secular liberal constituency that's already committed to this point of view. And indeed, there are further difficulties uh, because uh, modern conservatism, modern con cultural conservatism across the globe uh, has become very invested and very good uh, in using democratic arguments uh, and populist arguments against uh, liberal expertise. So the idea becomes that imposing secular liberal views, particularly by means of public education, uh, really gives conservatives uh, a hissy fit sometimes because this looks very undemocratic and very coercive. And indeed, from their point of view, this is quite understandable. It does very much look like that. Now, in these circumstances, uh, various forms of pseudoscience, creationism has been my example today, but this can, appeal to, uh, this can apply to other forms of pseudoscience as well, say, for example, Indian astrology in the Indian context. Uh, but for creationism or guided evolution points of view, sort of splitting the difference, uh, kind of uh, trying to find some accommodation between creation and evolution, in some ways, you can think of this as culturally and socially a kind of a useful middle point in a sense that it allows cultural conservatives to continue affirming technology, and as I mentioned before, they tend to be very enthusiastic, enthusiastic about technology, and much of the modern world, and also at the same time retain many of their traditional beliefs, sometimes in changed forms. 
So to a politician, this might look like, hey, this actually looks good. Politically and socially, it's kind of a low-cost, low-conflict solution of having uh, religious belief in uh, modern circumstances and modern technology. So inevitably, in situations like this, there's going to be a huge pressure on, say, scientific and educational establishments to compromise science education in this way. Because scientific institutions, when conflicting with religions, and let's face it, scientific institutions do conflict with religions in many issues, uh, we cannot always claim a privileged political position. Uh, for about a century right now, uh, we've been doing pretty well for ourselves in science in claiming a privileged position and getting away with it, particularly because we have enjoyed a high degree of support from religious liberals but we cannot count on this lasting forever. And in many circumstances, in many states, uh, this kind of alliance is already kind of uh, very much frayed. And so from a politician's point of view, politically, it can start to look like compromising science education is actually quite rational. So I'm afraid one of these days, Missouri is gonna pass a bill that's gonna allow intelligent design in classrooms and things like that because it's gonna look like the right thing to do to politicians from democratic reasons. And Turkey already shows such circumstances, and parts of the United States, I think, are already headed in that direction. So to complicate matters further, uh, our current economic situation, particularly in the United States, uh, actually uh, worries me to a certain extent about this as well. Uh, because people who are forecasting what the future economy of the United States looks like are increasingly forecasting uh, that much of the population is going to be shunted uh, not into high paying, uh, highly skilled work, but we're looking at a de-skilled economy right now. That we're going to have increasingly, even more than what is already the case today, precarious, low level service based employment. Uh, this is not a constituency which you need to invest a lot in their science education for. Now, of course, this is a political choice that we've been making, though as usual in the United States, this is always dressed up as a kind of a market inevitability, uh, particularly in conservative discourse about these matters. But this leads to a bad environment for broad science education. So the future doesn't exactly look bright to me right now, though I'll also have to say I'm one of nature's pessimists, so it never looks bright to me. Also, uh, to complicate matters again, uh, the current talk about education reform in the, United State, in the United States, and indeed globally, because these types of situations appear all over the place, uh, the, the, the current discourse about education reform worries me as well. Because there's a lot of pressure to privatize education at this point. I mean, I, te I teach at a public liberal arts university and which decades ago when this was founded in the state of Missouri, which was as religious back then as it is right now, you could find a good deal of political support to have public education uh, and public higher education. Progressively, we have been completely defunded uh, since then, and I'm sure that, say for example, the University of Kansas, if you talk to the faculty over here, you get similar complaints all the time. Uh, we do not teach in states universities anymore, we teach in state-supported universities where the support is going down and down all over the place. Those of you who are in the audience who are students uh, immediately see the consequences of this because your tuition bills are getting immediately higher and higher every year. So education has been increasingly privatized in countries like the United States and Turkey. And in situations like this, the parallel, more religious secondary education systems uh, really gain strength. Uh, for example, in Turkey, what has happened is that there's kind of a parallel education system which ostensibly is there to, tr uh, to uh, train religious functionaries, but of course, it's become something about as large as the uh, secular education system. Uh, they tend to gain more power in privatization situations. And uh, similar worry should uh, occur to us in the United States as well. If you look at, say, for example, Christian private education and how creationism is uh, so pervasive in Christian education in the United States. Now, of course, uh, things being what they are, you generally have market justifications for this type of privatization, which emphasize immediate practical economic value of science. Uh, but then again, uh, I, I would have you recall my previous arguments which uh, pointed out that in this context of immediate market justifications of things, you might be able to favor applied science, but not necessarily basic science. And particularly evolution is not likely to be a priority in such, an env in such a political and economic environment.
So I think uh, non-religious constituencies should especially worry about a situation like this. And the reason is uh, a largely secular audience, like I imagine is today, uh, are really, I'm pre preaching to the choir in a certain uh, sense. Uh, secular people tend to strongly, very strongly support science and evolution, but the reason we tend to support science and the reason we support evolution in particular, uh, these reasons are largely cultural. Uh, and the fact that evolution tends to rub wrongly uh, uh, against religious sensibilities uh, for people who are non-religious like myself is actually kind of a bonus. I like evolution to be thought sometimes precisely because it upsets the religious right. And in the, enlight <laughs> in the Enlightenment tradition, which secular liberals belong to, uh, education has historically been very important. Uh, for centuries, we've been talking about how evolution really is supposed to be the key to overcome religious indoctrination, religious obscurantism, and so forth. And for the past century, century and a half, in many of the uh, industrially more advanced countries, we've kind of had our way. Uh, but I am kind of worried whether this is going to be continuing. And in a situation like this, uh, the question becomes what to do. And I am not in a good position necessarily to answer a question like this, because it's very explicitly a political question. And people in science and science education, people like myself, uh, whatever credibility we have to talk in our own field often depends very much on our standing apart from politics. So if I were, very po if I, if I were a very political person, if I, my arguments involving science were very political, uh, that's actually going to harm the perception of science in the public arena. So I can't do that. Uh, but I can't sort of go and uh, rely on sort of secular liberal trust and expertise either. That's not our political context. Uh, that would be naive today. But standing back from politics, trying to pretend that we're not involved in politics at all, would be even more naive. Because modern conservatism across the globe notoriously politicizes everything. Not just evolution, but also issues like global warming and so forth. So really, at this point, I'm actually at something of a loss as to what to do. And I just want to stop right now and see if, uh, I don't know, you can help me out with any ideas of yourself. And I hope that we can have some conversations later in the day and maybe tell me what you think. Because I'm seriously worried about this sort of thing and I really don't know what to do. That's all I have to say. Anybody want to say something? Go ahead, blue t-shirt back there. Oh, that's you. Blue t-shirt? All oh, right. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, well, we're kind of caught in a double, bl uh, double bind over here, precisely because science has become very politicized these days. It used to be maybe a generation ago, uh, there might have been a more of a national political consensus, say, uh, where uh, both, say, Republicans and Democrats, uh, conservatives and liberals might have agreed that science is in general a good thing, let's support it, and let's be done with it. Kind of like a national security thing almost, like everybody supports that. But these days the environment is different. It's become much more politicized, and as I said, evolution and, and climate change are, are particularly salient examples here. So, say for example, a couple of years ago, I did a lobbying trip to Kansas, uh, to, to, sorry, Washington, why is Kansas? <laughs> and uh, to talk to, say, congressional aides and things like that, uh, having to do with uh, legislation that was being proposed, having to do with uh, climate change. And we constantly found ourselves in that sort of situation. We were being brought in as experts, but when we started talking about issues that had to do with global warming, immediately that sort of tagged it as a political issue. And somehow what we were saying was not being heard, and it still isn't. So it's a tough situation to be in. I don't know what to do. I'm sorry? Right. Sure, yeah, that's a problem, yeah.
Oh yeah. 